Coming in at number 10, we've got Deathstroke versus Gorilla Grodd, two villains with an unexpected rivalry with incredibly tragic origins. While working for the villainous organization Hive, Deathstroke and his ex-wife Adeline Kane are captured when the group is surprise attacked by Vandal Savage and Gorilla Grodd, the latter of which winds up cutting Adeline's throat for a ritual to unlock the power of the Fountain of Youth. Outraged and heartbroken, Deathstroke would go on a violent spree to exact revenge on Grodd, attacking the heart of guerrilla civilization and killing multiple intelligent apes in his search for his true enemy, a situation where nobody wins and the villains just continue hurting themselves and others more and more. Coming in at number 9, Green Goblin vs Hobgoblin. Green Goblin vs Hobgoblin seems to only have happened in the 90s Spider-Man animated series that you know I love to talk about, but it could have happened elsewhere just according to my research. After Hobgoblin was introduced before Green Goblin, Oz Osborn went kinda nuts because, you know, goblin. But since Osborn was the one who equipped the Hobgoblin, he was able to know where he'd be and who he was under the mask, resulting in Goblin attacking Hobby at Wilson Fisk's tower base, kinda thing. Who had also been discovered by Spider-Man who was shocked to see multiple goblins. This fight was certainly more tame since it was a 90s cartoon, but it's still pretty damn cool to see the goblins going at it, in like a fighting to see which goblin reigns supreme kinda way, not going in any other way, you freaking sicko. Okay, I know where your mind is. While you're in the gutter, could you cl please clear it out? Okay, it's full of leaves. Coming in at number 8, we've got Ultimate Dr. Octopus versus Ultimate Green Goblin. In the Ultimate Marvel Universe, both Otto Octavius and Norman Osborn became their supervillain alter egos in the same accident, with Otto's mechanical arms being grafted onto his body in the same experiment that transformed Norman Osborn into a muscular version of the Green Goblin. After fighting together against Spider-Man for years, Doc Ock finally saw an opportunity to leave his life of crime behind when he was free from prison. However, the Green Goblin refused to give up on his quest for revenge, and after being enraged by Otto's comments on Spider-Man potentially being their greatest creation as scientists, he flat out murdered Octavius in the street to keep the rest of his super-powered followers in line. That's gonna be a yikes for me, you Norman. And it's 7 Captain Cold vs Johnny Quick. In the same issue as Lex vs Reverse Shazam, Captain Cold is brought to the Watchtower to assist the hero and stopping the Injustice League. However, it didn't look like things were going in Snart's favor during Forever Evil 006, since Johnny Quick had him against a wall, saying, you know, I killed you on my Earth too. Only that version didn't have this stupid ass freeze gun. If only you could use it, which honestly seems like he had him by the ropes, until Snart simply says, Jingle bells, Batman smells, which activates your remote trigger, causing the gun to shoot Johnny Quick in the leg. This followed by a swift kick to the frozen section of thigh, shatters the dominant leg of Skidmark, as Snart called him, which I find absolutely hilarious. Ending this scene with a, see, Flash and I got mutual respect. That's the difference between you and him, besides having two legs. I don't know why I think he sounds like that, I just do. It's probably because he started off the phrase with C, but it's, it's certainly in a moment that I'm sure Snart had been waiting a long time for, even if it wasn't his Flash, but if he did that, that would ruin their mutual respect, see? Coming in at number 6, we have to go with the Riddler vs the Joker, a confrontation so huge that it spawned an entire comic book event and turned all the villains of Gotham City against one another. When the Riddler reached out to the Joker to ask for his help in teaming up to finally kill the Batman together, the Joker responded by unexpectedly shooting the Riddler flat out in the stomach. This one act of violence kickstarted a series of escalations that wouldn't stop until hundreds more were dead and all of Gotham City had been carved out by the two warring factions. And while the two villains would eventually reconcile after Batman foiled both of their master plans, it just goes to show how dangerous two angry supervillains pointed at one another can be. Halfway through in at number 5, Venom vs Carnage. Venom vs Carnage comes up whenever and whatever reality Carnage is introduced in. And while yes, Venom is a villain, he has a purpose. The symbiote wants to get back to Spider-Man and Brock wants to kill him. Sometimes the to share this goal. However, Carnage just wants, well, Carnage. So when he starts going a little too berserk, Venom does end up teaming up with Peter to stop him. Whether it's just because he needs Spider-Man alive, or Carnage goes too far and kidnaps someone Brock cares about, like in the 90s animated cartoon. But either way, it's certainly an interesting scenario, especially with Venom Let There Be Carnage having come out recently, which features this fight just as literally the main point of the movie. However, usually Venom doesn't seem to fear his asexually spawned son, which is, it's still weird. Carnage is is Venom's son, 
That's an awkward family reunion. Like, why are there so many awkward familial relationships in comic books? I don't get it. Like, oh, what are you doing, Step Symbiote? Coming in at number four, we've got two of the most powerful villains in the Marvel Universe with Thanos versus Galactus. Now, with power levels as high as these two, their battling is a topic that is often debated by fans, as different encounters have led to very different outcomes. In situations where he's faced Galactus without an item, such as the Infinity Gauntlet on hand, Thanos has been essentially outmatched, only capable of landing a single blow on Galactus before the godlike strength of the power cost was able to defeat him. However, Thanos has a particular fondness for the Infinity Gems, they kind of made a few movies about those, and these powerful stones put him on a much more even playing field, able to beat the Power Cosmic down into submission, and even crushing Galactus between two different planets. Come on guys, can't we all just learn to get along? Getting close to the end in number 3, General Zod versus the Suicide Squad. Amanda Waller, director of Task Force X, has handpicked the members of her Suicide Squad to hand handle any dirty job she throws their way. This time, however, what she wants belongs to one of Superman's deadliest antagonists, and getting it is more important than ever. But no matter what Waller may hold over him, Zod kneels to no one, and it's not long before he and the rest of Task Force X are at each other's throats. Will Waller's plan to make this Kryptonian war criminal a full-fledged member of the Suicide Squad live up to its enormous potential? Or will it actually doom the entire planet to devastation and alien enslavement? That's the question, isn't it? In the Suicide Squad Volume 4, Earthlings on Fire storyline, Task Force X goes toe to toe with General Zod while trying to steal a piece of kryptonite from LexCorp. However, the story actually ends up with Zod joining the team after getting a kryptonite bomb implanted in his brain. Ha! <laughs> Ouch. Coming in at number two, we've got our boy Thanos again, but this time he's facing off with Doctor Doom. And unfortunately, while the Infinity Gems might have given the Mad Titan the strength to stand up to Galactus and the Power Cosmic, in this one specific battle with Doom, Thanos didn't stand a chance. During the Battle World saga, in which Victor Von Doom had become God Emperor Doom, Thanos approached his enemy on the battlefield and tried to give Doom one last chance to bow before a true God. And sadly for Thanos, he was vastly overestimating himself, as God Emperor Doom was capable of pulling a Mortal Kombat style fatality and pulling Thanos' spine and skull out of his still living body. And while eventually Doom would be overthrown and the Marvel Universe put back mostly to normal, Thanos will definitely think twice before trying to smack talk Doctor Doom ever again. Finally, in a number one, Joker vs. Red Skull. In 1996, Batman and Captain America came together for a crossover the likes of which nobody had ever seen. I mean, that's probably slightly exaggerated. But this was still a highly anticipated team up because let's be real, it's Cap and Batman. However, when two heroes team up, you know that their villains are bound to as well. So the Joker and Red Skull had formed an alliance. That is, until the Joker found out who Red Skull really served. That being the German soldiers present in World War II because I can't mention them for monetization reasons. Thanks YouTube, let's censor history. What are you, the public school system? Anyway, after finding out Red Skull's affiliations and who was really involved in the plan, Joker turned on Red Skull, showing that he at least had a bit of a moral code, saying, quote, I may be a criminal lunatic, but I'm an American criminal lunatic. I don't know why Joker was shocked, given that Red Skull was literally walking around with that symbol on his chest, but Joker just seemed to think that it was a crazy disguise, which is the dumbest thing ever. Like, I think that's the dumbest thing that Joker's ever done. Like, even if it was a disguise, would you really want to be seen with that just walking around? Even if you are a criminal lunatic? Because of course not, you said it yourself, you're an American criminal lunatic. I mean, like, think for once, bro, come on. And in 10, Magneto vs. Red Skull. Even when the Joker doesn't want to work with the Red Skull, it's surprising that Marvel tried to make this team up work. In Captain America number 367, during the Acts of Vengeance storyline, multiple villains had changed their target, or I guess their adversaries, in an attempt to catch them off guard. However, the alliance of Magneto and Red Skull was yet another short-lived one thanks to Red Skull's, um... Allegiances. Red Skull tried to fight back, but let's be honest, there was nothing he could really do to stop Magneto. Eventually, Magneto ended up winning, which seems obvious, but instead of killing Red Skull, Magneto did what he thought would be the worst thing he could do. He trapped Red Skull in an abandoned bomb shelter, seemingly from World War II, or at least that's what I would have done, and left him with just enough water for a few weeks. I'm not sure about food, but to be fair, you can go like three weeks without food or something like that. Isn't there like the rule of like threes or whatever, right? Like three days for water, three weeks for food. So even giving him no food, Red Skull would still have a few weeks. 
And at 9, Lex Luthor versus Mazass. Alexander Luthor was one of the heroes of Earth 3, and was the crime syndicate's most formidable and greatest enemy, having killed off many of its members over the years, including Hawkwing and Will Bastin. He also had the ability to absorb the powers of any superhero, super powered being that he killed, through the lightning of Mazass, which is... Shazam backwards. Alexander was brought to Earth Prime by the crime syndicate of his world thanks to Superwoman when the villains sought refuge in the fallen Justice League Watchtower. However, since they were on Earth Prime, Alexander ended up running into Lex, and he tried to kill Lex. But as he tried, Bizarro attacked him. Bizarro stood no match. And as Alexander prepared to kill his Prime Earth counterpart of Lex Luthor, Lex ended up realizing that they both sounded the same. They both spoke the same way, because, you know, they're both a Lex Luthor. So he held on to the future lightning rod that Black Adam had shoved into Mazal's chest and yelled his magic word, taking Alex's power away with a blast of dark lightning. The magic word being Shazam backwards, if you couldn't tell. Lex then proceeded to stab Alex in the chest fatally a second time and covering his mouth to prevent him from saying the magic word once again to save himself, avenging the fallen Bizarro, but I, I don't I doubt that that's what that was about. And at 8, The Lizard vs. Doctor Doom. The Lizard vs. Doctor Doom actually takes place in the Spider-Man 90s animated series. <laughs> well, at least the version I'm talking about. And is the 11th episode of the 5th season, which is actually around the end of the series, with this episode also being the final appearance of the Black Cat. The episode entitled Secret Wars Part 3 Doom is about Spider-Man and his amazing friends of Captain America, Iron Man, Storm, Black Cat, the Lizard, and the Fantastic Four going to the new Latveria that Doom had created on this world and stopping him. However, this obviously results in a fight and Lizard, who currently has Dr. Connor's intelligence thanks to Reed Richards, assists the heroes in this battle, resulting in Dr. Doom vs. Lizard. The whole point of this three episode arc was that the Beyonder had found a world that did not know evil, and set Red Skull, Dr. Doom, the Lizard, and Doc Ock loose on this earth just to see what would happen. And then, after six months, the world was in ruins and he tasks Spider-Man to save the world in the ultimate battle of good against evil. This story is directly followed by the spider War storyline in the show where they ended up introducing Spider-Carnage, my favorite character in the show, but it's still something interesting to behold. And it's 7, New Goblin vs. Sandman and Venom. Spider-Man 3, while not the most favorite Sam Raimi movie, is still, in my opinion, a good movie. I, I like the scenes that everyone finds to be cringy, because I'm just, I'm just a cringy guy. That, that thing, that's me. <laughs> but I also love the climactic battle. Seeing Spider-Man get pummeled by two villains is certainly a harrowing sight, especially when he's already basically lost everything. But then an unlikely hero comes in, a man who has been the villain the whole movie, Harry Osborn, also known as the New Goblin, who had taken the same serum as his father, but ends up using it in a better way. He ends up being critical in the fight against Sandman and Venom, using his bombs to take down Sandman and helping Peter save MJ and get to Venom before it was too late. This is certainly not a copy for this list though because he was the villain the whole movie, okay? At least when he didn't lose his memories. Let's be honest here, okay? You know that even if it had its moments, it was still a good movie. I will die on this hill every single time. If they can edit this in, I'm also in support of Spider-Man 3. I'll put that on the record. <laughs> And at 6, Venom vs. Toxin. Born from Carnage as the 1000th symbiote in his lineage, Toxin was feared to be the strongest and most dangerous of their race by both Carnage and Venom. Carnage fears you, yeah, that's a bad thing. Shortly after being born, the symbiote united with police officer Pat Mulligan. Years later, the symbiote was removed from Mulligan by Blackheart, who beat Pat Mulligan to death in a gutter. With the help of Venom though, Jack O'Lantern took it to his boss, Crime Master. Crime Master found the perfect host in Eddie Brock, who he forced to become Toxin's host. At this point, uh, Eddie Brock wasn't Venom's host, it was Flash Thompson. After bonding with Eddie, Toxin took over its host and worked with the Savage Six, attacking its grandfather symbiote Venom. Toxin tells Venom that after Venom is gone, only it will remain for an event that it called the Spawning. The meaning of this is unknown, as of now, but that doesn't matter. Venom managed to incapacitate Toxin, but chose not to kill it or its host, because it was Eddie. Later, Toxin attacked Venom and was separated from Eddie, so Venom set the symbiote on fire, but it managed to grab hold of Eddie and drag him into the flames to die alongside it. But they didn't actually end up dying, so he was back. Halfway through into number 5, Joker vs. Simon. Physicist Simon Jones was working on experiments in contacting other dimensions when he was contacted, in turn, by the demon Trigon the Terrible, the father of the superhero teen titan known as Raven. Trigon used his abilities to transform Jones into a powerful psychic with telepathic and telekinetic powers and gave him the mission to just destroy the Earth. Finding an ad by the psychopathic supervillain Dr. Light in the Underworld Star, a criminal underground paper, Jones, now calling himself Simon, 
Simon, with a PSI, joined Light's new group, the Fearsome Five. However, after various outings as a supervillain, recently Simon was seen among the new Injustice League and was one of the villains featured in Salvation Run, exiled to a new savage world. He attempted to convince his fellow supervillains that escape was impossible, and then proceeded to lay down plans for beginning a new civilization. However, he was interrupted by the Joker, who killed him by breaking the dome which housed his brain and repeatedly smashing it with a rock. Gotta love those kinda quick yet brutal killings. Am I right, fellas? In it for Ultron vs Thanos. Ultron vs Thanos is an idea that we've been asking as comic fans for a while. However, this question was actually answered thanks to the Disney Plus series of What If. In the 8th episode of Season 1, we got to see what would have happened to the MCU if Ultron had won and gotten the Vision's body. If the heroes had failed to steal it and put Jarvis's code inside, Ultron would have wiped everything out, apparently. Using the Mind Stone and his vibranium body to decimate everything and everyone. Until only he remained. However, it was certainly easier to do this after Thanos showed up with the other 5 Infinity stones. We expected a climactic and epic battle, but instead it got honestly what would probably be pretty realistic. Ultron as Vision simply says fascinating and then uses the Mind Stone to slice Thanos in half resulting in him collecting all the Infinity Stones at once and just ruining everyone and everything. Showing us that the worst mistake in the MCU was killing Vision before Thanos showed up. Like why didn't he just think oh yeah I'll just slice him in two. Getting close to the end into number 3, Doomsday vs Darkseid. After a battle in Metropolis, Superman attached Doomsday's body to an asteroid, which is freaking brutal, and then he flung that asteroid into space. However, the issue ended with a panel of the reawakened and laughing Doomsday, still chained to the asteroid but otherwise alive. After passing through a wormhole, Doomsday's asteroid was found by a deep space scavenger ship. Upon examination of the particularly looking drifting rock, the ship crew retrieved the object object, hoping to find something of value. The scavenger vessel happened to be en route to Apocalypse, and you know what's gonna happen now. Darkseid has since been empowered by the fabled Omega Force after his first encounter with Doomsday, and oh yeah, they've already fought together at, at one point. But Doomsday was fully rested this time because, you know, he was chained to a freaking asteroid, and after slaughtering, the crew of the salvage ship found himself landing on a harsh world. Unknown to Superman, Doomsday had faced off and beaten Darkseid in single combat. Combat, even after withstanding the full effect of Darkseid's Omega Beams. And then he just laid waste to Apocalypse. And like, while the fight may have happened off screen, or I guess off page, it's pretty damn terrifying knowing that Doomsday just beat Darkseid, just cause he could. But ultimately, in number two, Venom vs. Null. Null is an eldritch god of darkness and the creator of all the symbiotes. He is the main antagonist of Venom Volume 4 and the King in Black event. Born from the primordial void that exists between the 6th and 7th cosmos, Null claims dominion over the void and to be its avatar, because of course he does. Why wouldn't he? But while he is a god of the void, he is not the primordial darkness itself. Awakened by the light when the Celestials invaded his kingdom of darkness, he created the first symbiote in the form of a sword and decapitated a Celestial with it. Yeah. He used the head's divine power to refine the blade, creating a metaphysical connection between the primordial symbiote and its slain cosmic god, which would be the source of most of Null's tremendous power. However, during the King of Black event, not only did Venom help fight against Null, but so did Toxin. Toxin, in fact, combined with two other symbiotes in order to help take Null down, which they did end up succeeding in, even if Null had already given all or most of the Marvel characters their own symbiote at the time. Finally, in number one, Lex Luthor and Joker versus Alexander Luthor. Infinite Crisis was the reboot of the DC multiverse after Crisis on Infinite Earths had destroyed it. But of course, thanks to the genius of Alexander Luthor, the Lex from Earth 3 that was supposed to be killed but wasn't because of the new Earth made by Crisis, he thought that recreating the multiverse and that he should do so in his own image. Again, of course he did. Luthor becomes confident enough of this plan though to finally reveal his presence to Kal-El's cousin, Power Girl, who had recently not remembered that she was the only survivor of the former Earth 2. Luthor told her that the current reality was corrupt because it had used Earth-1 as a template, and that, with her help, he and her cousin could reform the universe with Earth-2 as its basis. But he ends up, in essence, waiting to turn this new Earth into the rest of the multiverse into his kingdom, because, you know, again, gotta do what you gotta do. Just as he's about to carry out his plan, though, the original Lex Luthor along with the Joker show up and kill him. But let's be honest, it probably wasn't for long. Like, man, we can't have, like, a genuinely good Lex Luthor, can we? Like, unless he's, like, raising his son while living with his brother Charlie. Oh wait, no, that's just John Cry. 
Fryer. Number 10, Savage Alliance. While Maximum Carnage is often thought of as the first fight between Venom and Carnage, and the one used for inspiration when it comes to the film Venom, Let There Be Carnage, the truth is there were a few tussles before that story actually happened. One of my favorite involves Venom and Carnage fighting over an innocent life, a wee bebe. In issue 362 of The Amazing Spider-Man, Spider-Man and Venom have agreed to team up to take down Carnage. Despite what the cover will make you think happens, the two do actually stick together in this initial fight against the villain prior to Maximum Carnage. Carnage does offer Venom a team up in rebuttal in this issue though, knowing how much Eddie Brock and Venom hate Spider-Man, as that is apparently all Eddie talked about back when Cletus and him were sharing a jail cell. However, Venom refuses the offer, responding, attempting offer, but in this case, business before pleasure. The fight is momentarily interrupted when a banging is heard from the apartment building floor below. A woman is banging her broom on the ceiling, demanding quiet for her baby who is trying to sleep. I guess their fight is making a lot of noise, which makes a lot of sense. Carnage responds by tearing his way through the floor, taking the baby and using it to distract Venom so that he can get away. Don't worry, the baby is saved by Venom in the end, though Carnage does get away and heads to terrorize J. Jonah Jameson. Gasp. Poor Jameson. Number 9, Maximum Carnage. Maximum Carnage was a 14 part story arc that ran between multiple series, including Spider Man Unlimited, Web of Spider Man, The Amazing Spider Man, Just Spider Man, and The Spectacular Spider Man. Yeah, welcome to the 90s. If you wanted to read this story, you'd actually have to be reading all those series or find that thread that began it all back in Spider Man Unlimited, issue number one. And then, of course, follow that story through the other books. This fight was probably one of the most important in terms of firmly establishing the ongoing feud between Carnage and Venom, and the reluctant team up of Venom and Spider-Man, as well as highlighting the heroic potential Venom as a character possessed. In the end, a lot more heroes got involved, and the fight between Venom and Carnage continued through to the very end of this event in Spider-Man Unlimited issue number 2, even after Carnage was presumed dead. This also set up the ongoing trope of Carnage never really dying permanently, no matter what kind of insane injury he suffered. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list, and you want more lists about Carnage and Venom fisticuffs fighting each other, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Honestly, they fought a lot. There's, I could probably go on. I think I could do at least a part two, if not a part three. I feel like there's also gonna be people being like, more videos with cosplay. I'm gonna be like, look, you get it for Halloween, friends. Come for Halloween, stay for the year, come back for Halloween again, and there will be more cosplay. Number eight, Let There Be Carnage. Considering that Maximum Carnage is what lent inspiration to the makers of Venom, Let There Be Carnage, I feel like it would be a disservice to not mention the final fight between the two characters in that film. I'm gonna try to keep this point fairly vague on purpose, as I, I don't wanna spoil the film for those who maybe haven't been to see it just yet. After all, there's a lot of really great movies out right now, so no judgment if you haven't been there yet. But what I will say is, Shri presence adds a very interesting dynamic to the fight between these two villains, or villain and anti-hero, villain and hero I guess in this universe, I don't know. And in the end, this fight also feels quite final. In the comics, Shriek is also a character who is present in Maximum Carnage, which Let There Be Carnage is based off of. She's often known for being Cletus Cassidy's girlfriend and ally, who is almost just as deranged as he is. Shriek's sonic scream abilities mean that her interaction with both symbiotes who are sensitive to sound means that Having her involved in the film and this final fight makes for a really interesting watch. All I'm gonna say about that. Number seven, Carnage Unleashed. In Carnage Unleashed, Venom and Carnage end up in one of the most 90s battles ever. Even more 90s than their original fight, also involving Spider Man in Maximum Carnage. Because in this fight, they're going into the internet. Venom Carnage Unleashed is a story that centers around a Carnage video game being made by Extreme Violence Video Games, who turn to imprisoned Cletus Cassidy to play test the game. In retrospect, it's a pretty bad idea, especially as we learn through this story that it is possible for Carnage to reach through the computer screen and thereby escape prison and terrify anyone connected to the internet network. In the end, this means both Venom and Carnage's physical battle also goes digital when they chase each other across the interwebs, and also across various forms of media, because apparently that's how the internet worked in the 90s. <laughs> At least that's how we thought it worked in the 90s. Number six, Venom Triumphant. This battle comes to us from Peter Parker 
for Spider-Man issue number 10 back in 1999. Oh, there were so many Spider-Man comics in the 90s, so many different titles. Here Venom confronts Cletus Cassidy while he's locked up. Venom believes that their offspring Carnage can do much better than Cletus and refuses to let the homicidal serial killer keep its child. Instead, it insists on taking back the symbiote offspring and eats a good amount of the Carnage symbiote in order to reclaim it. Out of love, you see. It's, I'm like, I'm gonna eat you because I love you. I want you to be back with me. While the fight is pretty quick and only a few pages long, it's been suggested that Venom eating Carnage actually caused the Carnage symbiote to try to take control from within a Venom, which prompted Venom to act more violently moving forward from this fight. As in most fights where Venom takes on Carnage, Venom ends up triumphant this time around, but it's also a lot easier of a win for our anti-hero Venom because Carnage is, you know, locked up. So usually those fights go on a lot longer because Carnage is pretty powerful. Number 5. Fight to kill slash protect Toxin This one is a pretty unique fight in the history of these two characters as it ended up starting out as a team up. Well, initially it was a fight, but most team ups honestly they start that way so. Here Eddie and Cletus with their respective symbiotes were fighting to get Toxin, Carnage's offspring. However, both of them then realized they wanted Toxin dead just for different reasons. Venom didn't want another Carnage existing in the world, one is enough, thank you very much, and Carnage didn't want the competition, worried that their offspring would potentially surpass them. However, when Toxin was revealed to be more aligned with the side of good, and definitely not as sadistic as their parent Carnage, Venom and Carnage came to blows once more, with Venom wanting now to protect Toxin and Carnage of course still wanting to destroy them. Carnage was like, cool, you're good. I definitely want to destroy you. I like destroying things that are good. Number 4. Carnage USA Carnage USA is a story arc contained in its own miniseries where Carnage takes hold of an entire town and the Avengers attempt to stop him. However, it is then revealed that it was all a trap, as the Avengers are who Carnage really wants. Carnage takes hold of the heroes, also bending them to his will, making them watch all of the horrible things that he's doing to this town. In the end, Flash Thompson's Agent Venom comes in with his own team and fights to take Carnage down. Breaking his control over the town. The fight ends up actually coming down to the two symbiotes themselves versus one another, with the heroes trying to help out the Venom symbiote, and Flash versus Cletus, both of which don't actually have legs without their symbiotes, so they're basically having this fight without having any legs. In the end, the heroes, Agent Venom included, win the day, but there is still a lot the town has lost at this point. Although, you know, to be fair, Carnage was like, I want to take over the world, and at least they prevented Carnage from doing that, so still good. Just, there's a lot of people that are traumatized now. Number 3. Venomized During the Venomized series, which was part of the Venomverse event, we saw a poison carnage introduced. Venom ends up facing off with this version of Cletus Cassidy who is brought back to life by the poisons at the end of issue 1 of Venomized. While Carnage is once again defeated this time around, in addition to all the invading poisons, they lose track of him and he ends up being MIA when they are taking stock of all their defeated foes. I believe from here, Cletus ends up falling to earth with his poison and the remnants of the Carnage symbiote still within him, which basically awaken to try to protect him, but all in all, they all kind of get burned up as they enter Earth's atmosphere. But don't worry, even as a corpse, Cletus still has a lot of fight left in him. Also, sorry if some of that didn't make sense. I haven't actually read all of Venomverse, so I'm trying to understand it a little bit from like the outside in because I've only read parts. <laughs> so please forgive me. Venomverse is wonky. Not a bad way, just in a comic book way. Number two, Absolute Carnage. Absolute Carnage was an epic summer event and battle that I would say was a big, if not the big, high point of Donny Cates' run on Venom. Here Carnage returned after literally being burned up as he fell to Earth from outer space, both the symbiote and Cletus Cassidy. However, the cult of Null got their hands on Cletus' remains and used them in a ritual to breathe life back into him, bonding him with the Grendel symbiote to create a new Carnage and beginning the process to fully awaken Null, the god of symbiotes, one of the biggest bads around. In Absolute Carnage, Venom fought against Carnage, teaming up with many other heroes and villains to try and stop him from collecting all the codices located within the spines of all who had ever been bonded to a symbiote. Collecting all of these within himself would allow Carnage to awaken Null. In the end, even though Carnage was defeated, Null still awoke because, well, all the codices still ended up being gathered and a sacrifice still ended up happening to seal that ritual, with Carnage becoming that sacrifice instead of Dylan, Eddie's son. That was the choice. Venom had at the end. It was like, I'm either gonna kill your son or you're gonna kill me, but either way, Null wakes up, so either way, I win. It's a 
it's a lose-lose situation for Venom there. Number one, Future Fight. It isn't here yet, and if it's up to Flash, it will never happen, but it seems pretty inevitable that Carnage and Venom will fight again in the future. Oh, did you think he was gone after Absolute Carnage? Never. He's never gone. He never dies permanently. Have you learned nothing from this list? Come on. This is a guy that's been blown up, been burned up, basically been like ripped apart, and any time he seems to die, he comes back. So you just, you can't get rid of him. Even if you rip him to pieces, he'll still be like, I'm good. I'm here. Even after Carnage's defeat in Absolute Carnage, where he was technically bonded with the reanimated corpse of Cletus Cassidy, Carnage still managed to survive his death at the hands of Eddie Brock's Venom. Carnage is currently plotting from within the hive mind, planning on overthrowing Eddie, who has become the new King in Black, after also defeating Null in the King in Black event. Flash, however, is trying to put together his own symbiote army to stop Carnage before he can get to Eddie, but like I said, I think we all know where this is really headed. <laughs> if this list has taught us anything, it's that Venom and Carnage will always fight. And Venom pretty much will always win, except in Absolute Carnage, Carnage did kind of win even though he died died. Coming in at number 10, we have a particularly memorable battle between Batman and Darkseid. While most battles between these two foes have been more strategic or mental affairs, given the vast power difference between the human Batman and the godlike leader of Apocalypse, this occasion called for a bit more brute force. When Darkseid had stolen the body of a temporarily deceased Damian Wayne, his father wasted no time in launching a full-scale attack on Apocalypse to return Damian's remains home. Using an incredibly unstable exoskeleton called the Hellbat armor that's powerful alone nearly killed Batman just by wielding it, Batman was able to defeat Darkseid's son and then face the new god in physical combat while his companions escaped. It was a one in a million plan that just barely succeeded, but it just goes to show that even an ordinary man like Bruce Wayne can stand up to an evil god. At number 9, we've got to go with an iconic clash between Superman and Imperiex. A lesser known Superman villain from the year 2000, Imperiex claimed to be the being that lit the fuse on the Big Bang, and wanted to cause a similarly huge explosion to end the current DC Universe. Naturally, the heroes of Earth banded together to stop this intergalactic threat, but found themselves outmatched when Imperiex combined his might and consciousness with that of both Brainiac and the weaponized space station Warworld. It was only through Superman's immense strength and the clever use of a boom tube that Superman was able to send this villain back to the initial Big Bang and destroy him in the very explosion that began it all. Coming in at number 8, we're taking a brief detour into the Marvel Cinematic Universe with the Scarlet Witch versus Agatha Harkness. After multiple episodes of magic, deception, and sitcom-inspired hijinks, the grand finale of WandaVision saw our biggest magical battle in the MCU yet, with Wanda Maximoff finally starting to realize her potential as a wielder of chaos magic, and the devious Agatha Harkness attempting to seize that power for her own. With the entire battle taking place in a reality of Wanda's own making, and with the massive ruins used to finally outwit Agatha, this battle was one for the ages, and it's exciting to think of where magical battles in the MCU will go next when we finally get to see Wanda again in Doctor Strange 2. At number 7, we've got another MCU adjacent battle with The Watcher versus Ultron. For the entirety of Marvel's What Ifs first season, The Watcher vowed to never interfere with the different stories he was telling. But when the victorious Ultron of a dark universe collected all of the Infinity Stones, he became powerful enough to become aware of both The Watcher and the multiverse. Battling across multiple realities, The Watcher was eventually forced to take action and put together a team made up of beings from across the multiple realities, becoming the guardians of the multiverse, and finally being able to take Ultron down. Coming in at number 6, we have the Sentry versus the Incredible Hulk. After a long exile in outer space, the Hulk was understandably more than a little pissed at the Earth's heroes, and thus began the World War Hulk event as the big green monster returned to Earth. At first, the super strong hero known as the Sentry didn't want to join the battle, fearing the destruction that would take place, but soon began to relish the opportunity to fight someone he could actually punch without immediately disintegrating them. With two of the most powerful Avengers in existence clashing, the only thing that finally caused them to stop 
was the realization that if they both kept pushing their powers to their limit, the entire world might shatter before they do. Talk about some pretty high stakes. Coming in at number 5, we have Old King Thor versus Loki the Necro God. In the distant future, at the very, very end of the Marvel Universe, almost all life is already extinguished as the cosmos reaches its natural death. An elderly King Thor, however, finds that he still has one last enemy to defeat, his own brother Loki, but this time empowered with the same darkness created by the Dark God Null, and that technically even counts as the very first symbiote. All Black the Necrosword. With few mortals left to worry about, these two gods are finally able to unleash their full powers on one another in a final battle to determine once and for all which brother will come out on top. Coming in at number 4, we have the Spectre versus the Anti-Monitor. At the very end of the event known as Crisis on Infinite Earths, all hope seemed lost. The Anti-Monitor had brought all of his enemies to the dawn of creation and begun absorbing their powers for his final act that would destroy the DC multiverse and leave only the Antimatter universe remaining. But at the last possible moment, the Spectre intervened. A mysterious DC hero that's now known to literally be the embodiment of the Wrath of God, the Spectre was able to single-handedly hold back the Anti-Monitor and ultimately cause the creation of a new DC universe instead of the pure destruction that the Anti-Monitor desired. At number 3, we've got to go with the climactic showdown from one of the most beloved graphic novels of all time, Dr. Manhattan vs. Ozymandias in Watchmen. This battle was more of a philosophical debate than a physical confrontation, but still led to explosive results and held the entire fate of the Watchmen universe in the balance. To do what he deemed to be necessary to save humanity, Ozymandias faked an alien invasion against the world to unite America and the USSR against the common foe. To do this, he needed to manipulate Dr. Manhattan, the most powerful being in the universe, into believing he should leave Earth as to not interfere with Ozymandias' plans. By the time Dr. Manhattan returned, it was too late to prevent millions of deaths, and thus Manhattan eventually agreed that the best course of action was to let Ozymandias' actions remain unpunished. Definitely not a typical superhero versus supervillain story, but in the Watchmen universe, this is is about as close as you're gonna get. Coming in at number two, we have Thanos versus Thor, but in a weird twist, Thanos was actually kind of the good guy in this one. During an event called Blood and Thunder, during which Thor apparently lost control of both his powers and his mind, many cosmic heroes such as Adam Warlock and the Silver Surfer had to team up to try and subdue the God of Thunder. With none of them being physically strong enough to hold down Thor, the heroes were forced to teleport Thor to the one villain that could hold his own, Thanos. While Thanos enjoyed their evenly matched fight at first, he soon realized that Thor's lack of control could prove deadly for the entire universe and eventually was able to stun Thor with a surprise laser attack. And while Thor would eventually go back to the side of good, it's nice to know that even Thanos has some standards. Sometimes. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, we have the Darkest Knight versus Golden God Mode Wonder Woman. During the grand finale of the Dark Knight's death metal event, the DC multiverse seemed to be at its bleakest moment. The Batman who laughs had been upgraded with all of the godlike powers of Dr. Manhattan, had already defeated Perpetua, the creator of the multiverse, and was set to remake reality in his own hellish image. The only being capable of standing up to the Darkest Knight was Wonder Woman, using all of her godly energy and forging an armor of pure anti-crisis energy with the power of her lasso of truth. Even with all of this strength, Wonder Woman was just barely able to push the Darkest Knight into the final sun at the very death of the universe, putting an end to the biggest battle the DC multiverse had ever seen. Coming in at number 10, we have Ultimate Captain America versus Ultimate Giant Man. Now, the Ultimate Universe is well known for being a bit edgier and darker than the regular Marvel Universe, and no two characters better represent this than its versions of Steve Rogers and Hank Pym, with Steve being a much more violent 
violent soldier, and Hank being a self-loathing domestic abuser. Following an incident in which he set his aunts upon his own wife, Steve Rogers confronted Hank Pym inside a bar against the orders of his superiors and demanded Hank change size and fight him. The resulting brawl destroys half of a city block, but ends with Steve still being able to knock Hank unconscious, showing that in this case, size definitely isn't everything. Coming in at number 9, we have Hawkeye versus the Incredible Hulk. While most battles with the Hulk turn into massive city-spanning brawls, this hero versus hero encounter is more tragic than anything else. During the event known as Civil War II, the Avengers receive a vision from the future that appears to show the Hulk killing most of his teammates. Given that Bruce Banner hasn't turned into the creature for at least a year by this point, the other Avengers are obviously concerned. Unfortunately, they barely have a chance to debate with Bruce before Hawkeye has shot a fatal arrow killing Bruce instantly. And while it would later be revealed that Bruce had asked Hawkeye to do this to prevent him from hurting anyone else, and that Bruce would also eventually be resurrected by his own gamma mutation, it still was a tremendously dramatic and intense moment in an event filled with dramatic and intense moments. Coming in at number 8, we're taking a detour into the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Thor vs. Hulk from the third Thor film, Thor Ragnarok. After being stranded on the mysterious planet of Sakaar, Thor is originally overjoyed to see his friend from work, Bruce Banner. Unfortunately, the Hulk has fully embraced his new role as a Sakarian gladiator fighting under the Grand Master, and Thor has to battle with his former ally for the amusement of the crowd. This fight scene is one of the funnest in the entire MCU, and has delighted fans ever since it was first shown off in the very first Ragnarok trailer, giving us multiple callbacks to other films and giving us a delightful new status quo for Thor and the Hulk. Coming in at number 7, we have Captain America vs. Star-Lord. Also taking place in the event Civil War II, this superhero showdown was thankfully a lot less personal for Cap than the original Civil War event, but also featured some heroes that weren't around for the first superhero smackdown. One of the most notable of those heroes was Star-Lord, who wasn't yet a big name during Civil War I, but had seen renewed success following the release of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, and thus was a shoe in to be featured in the sequel. Coming to Captain Marvel's aid as she stood on the pro-future vision side of the debate, Star-Lord soon found himself in fisticuffs with Captain America himself, complaining about having to fight a guy with a shield. We've all been there, Peter. We've all been there. Coming in at number 6, we have Spider-Man vs. Iron Man. While these two characters have a close relationship in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and even fought on the same side during the MCU Civil War, things are a bit more complicated in the comic books. Originally siding with Iron Man, and even going so far as to reveal his identity to the public to support the Superhero Registration Act, Peter Parker eventually began to regret his actions and turned against his former friend. While Iron Man attempted to stop Spidey, with a failsafe protocol built into his iron spider suit, Peter revealed that he'd already reprogrammed it, showing that sometimes Tony Stark isn't the cleverest person in the room. Coming in at number 5, we have the Black Panther vs Wolverine. During a storyline in which the Phoenix Force, usually residing within Jean Grey, has chosen to take a new host, a tournament is fought for who should gain the honor. Two of the combatants that are given a small amount of the Phoenix Force for their bout are Wolverine and Black Panther both of whom are eager to battle one another to figure out which metal is stronger, Wolverine's adamantium skeleton or the vibranium of Wakanda. With both heroes even stronger and more violent than usual due to their phoenix possession, this fight nearly threatened to burn up the entire Marvel Universe. Coming in at number 4, we have the Hulk vs Vision. During a battle with the Hulk when Bruce Banner had lost control of the monster, the Vision attempted to use his density powers to make himself as strong and immune movable as the Hulk, only to find the Hulk was able to grow past his own strength. To thwart this, the Vision had to phase into the Hulk himself, trying to forge a mental connection with the Green Beast and reach Bruce Banner within. The visuals of a superhero literally phasing into another are both honestly super cool looking, but it winds up taking both the Vision's mental attacks and the pleading of Betty Ross to finally snap the Hulk out of it and return Bruce Banner's mind to the surface. Coming in at number 3, we have 
Spider-Man vs. Wolverine, a battle so long overdue that Spider-Man vs. Wolverine is literally the name of the comic it appeared in. Following the murder of his friend Ned Leeds, Peter Parker is rescued from gangsters by Wolverine while in Europe, and forced to use a low-quality Spider-Man fan costume he buys from a store. Originally working as teammates, Spider-Man and Wolverine unfortunately come to blows as Spidey realizes that Wolverine intends to kill the villains they've been fighting, and has to take on the bloodlust crazed mutant to prevent him from killing a woman named Charlie. Unfortunately, the woman winds up jumping in front of one of Spidey's fists herself, killing herself and traumatizing Peter in a very dark one-off that's probably best left in the 80s where it belongs. Coming in at number 2, we have Captain America vs Iron Man in the MCU film Captain America Civil War. While their fight in the comic books is an incredible spectacle all on its own, my personal favorite confrontation is how this movie deals with its final battle. Building us up with the expectation that Iron Man and Cap will have to team up to defeat an army of evil Winter Soldiers, a plot twist is thrown our way when the soldiers are revealed to be dead, and Baron Zemo reveals the reason he led the heroes out all this way was to show that Bucky Barnes killed Tony Stark's parents. Unable to accept that Cap never told him, Tony attacks Steve Rogers, and the two have a climactic battle that their friendship never really recovered from until the events of Avengers Endgame. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Thor vs Iron Man, following the events of the Civil War comic book series. Tony Stark has made a lot of iffy choices in the comics, but few have been as disastrous as his attempt at a Thor clone. Intended to be a powerful deterrent against Cap's team during Civil War, this clone called Ragnarok quickly went out of control and caused the deaths of several heroes. Whenever the true Thor returned, he was furious at what Tony had done with his genetic code, and fried every system in the suit of Iron Man armor, leaving Tony to walk back to Avengers HQ humiliated and defeated with one of the most decisive superhero smackdowns in comic book history. Number 10, Maker. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The Ultimate Universe is awesome. Hulk in this universe is actually quite a bit scarier, at least to me. You know who else is scarier? Reed Richards, the Maker. The Maker is the Reed Richards of the Ultimate Universe, who is evil. He's part of a group of superpowered beings alongside Hulk, Human Torch, Kang, and Quicksilver, who are called the Dark Ultimates. They are essentially villains together, and Hulk and Maker are actually kind of on the same team. Maker actually battles Hulk in a more psychological way, when he calms one of his rampages and convinces him he's being used by S.H.I.E.L.D. After a whole whack of confusing comic booky stuff, the Ultimates all team up and save the day, and then travel the cosmos hunting down the Maker. Number 9. The Leader. It's a great name, honestly. The Leader. Nice. Rightfully so, too. This guy is one of the Hulk's oldest rivals. Samuel Stearns was a janitor at a chemical facility where he unfortunately also had an incident involving gamma radiation. Samuel's gamma mutations gained him a super genius level intelligence, along with some telepathy. He also has the gamma ability of self-resurrection. There is actually an instance in Immortal Hulk number 39 in which he physically consumes the intelligence of another man, Brian Banner. But we don't know if this is a normal ability or a kind of mental representation of him consuming another person's knowledge, since he was in the below place at the time. The leader fights with Bruce on so many different occasions. But the Immortal Hulk story is the one I'm really into right now. You should check it out if you haven't before. Number 8, Maestro. The Maestro is technically Hulk himself, only an alternate version. One who lived through a nuclear apocalypse. He has the intelligence of Bruce, but basically double the strength of Hulk in his base form. He has easily defeated the Hulk several times, and his existence as a possible future version of the Hulk scares the hell out of Bruce himself. He is what would happen if he took the Hulk and made him evil and power hungry and powered him up. In his timeline, he rules over the megacity of Dystopia, where the remnants of humanity live, and he overthrew the former ruler Hercules not through pure strength, but through deception. He is powerful ruthless, and just a pretty rude dude. Well, here we are. We meet again at the end of the eighth point. You know how great you are? Pretty great. When you gingerly press upon that like and subscribe button, it lets us know that this is the kind of content you like to see. So, thanks for doing that. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, too. You can find a little extra content. All right, let's carry on, shall we? Number seven, 
Juggernaut. Kane Marco, the avatar of the god Sidorak. Kane is a Thor level threat to the Marvel Universe, wielding the abilities granted to him by the gem of Sidorak. Juggernaut has almost limitless super strength and stamina. He has a nearly invulnerable force field. He's immortal, and when he does somehow get damaged, he has a ridiculous healing factor. His main ability, however, is irresistible force embodiment, meaning once he begins to advance in a certain direction, it is virtually impossible to halt his movements. Guess who is one of the only characters to actually stop him? Thor! Yes, but shut up! Hulk! Hulk was one of them when he was War Hulk. Gosh, I gotta stop getting ahead of myself. Number six, Nightmare. A mysterious lord of fear. Nightmare is basically an unstoppable demon capable of capturing the astral form or spirit of a person while they are sleeping. Nightmare has been shown to be capable of subduing two earth demigods, an eternal and an elder god. That's the kind of power we're talking about. But you can solve any problem when you're an impossibly strong green monster made of pure muscle. Right? Nightmare manages to capture Hulk's mind and send him on a rampage against Dr. Stephen Strange. Luckily, the good doctor was able to contact Banner inside the Hulk's mind. I don't really know how one does this, but Banner transformed into the Hulk inside the Hulk's mind and fought off Nightmare. They've clashed a few other times, like when he took off Nightmare's head and stole his horse. Again, I don't know how it works, but it is what it is. Number 5, Onslaught. After Magneto used his powers to rip the adamantium out of Wolverine's body, Professor Xavier snapped and shut down the mind of Magneto. In the process of this, Xavier absorbed all the anger, grief, and lust for vengeance from Magneto's mind, which molded with every long suppressed negative feeling the professor had endured during the last 30 years. This resulted in a personality forming within Xavier known as Onslaught that would eventually separate to become a separate entity all on its own. Onslaught was incredibly powerful and all the Avengers, X-Men and Fantastic Four could not take him. That's when Bruce Banner's Hulk said hold my beer and told Phoenix to turn off the Bruce personality inside his head. She did and the Savage Hulk beat Onslaught so hard he destroyed his impenetrable armor, allowing Thor to land a massive blow and the heroes to take the win. Number four, Thanos. Thanos is an interesting one, and we're talking without the Infinity Gauntlet. See, he is exceedingly strong, so much so that he can stand toe to toe with Hulk, at least at Hulk's base strength. Thanos tends to have the advantage in most of their conflicts, using his intelligence and martial skill to take the win more often than not. We see an excellent example of this in the MCU's Infinity War, even if it was a stupid excuse for Hulk not to show up for the rest of the movie. The two of these guys have traded wins pretty evenly, but Thanos has the advantage in my mind. If you have the time, check out the Thanos vs Hulk 4 part story. It's a cool story involving Annihilus, and it leads right into Thanos the Infinity Relativity, which is also a really fun read. Number 3, Surtur. We mentioned the MCU in the last point, but I thought I'd go full force into it. In Thor Ragnarok, we get to see Hulk attack Surtur, the fire giant, as he is destroying Asgard with the Twilight Sword. It's actually really, really awesome. So he has fought Surtur, but how would that go in the comics? That's a good question. Well, we know that Surtur's main purpose is to beat Odin, so he is at least on Odin's level. You know who else is on Odin's level? Zeus. And Zeus and Hulk have had a bit of a scuffle once upon a time, which didn't go well for the Hulk. But then again, you take one of Hulk's more powerful forms, like Worldbreaker Hulk or Heart of the Monster Hulk, and Hulk takes the win every time. Number two, Galactus. He's a cosmic being who goes around eating planets, and he thinks he can try to come to Earth and pull that nonsense? We have a Hulk. Earth's dinner menu is no longer available. Oh, just kidding. Uh, the Hulk has not won against Galactus, and they've never really had a one on one fight. It's safe to say that of all the heroes on Earth, Hulk is maybe one who could make Galactus notice him, though. But that's likely as far as it will go. Just like with Surtur, in theory, he could win if he got angry enough, but we just haven't had an example of that. And it would have to be quite the insane level of power for Hulk to take the win. Hulk does actually become the herald of Galactus at one point when he becomes World Breaker Hulk in What If World War Hulk, and it is just insane. Number one, the one below all. In the Immortal Hulk storyline, Hulk is transported to the below place which is the realm of the one below all. Now, just to give some context, in Marvel Comics there's a character called the one above all, who hasn't really been seen all too often, but 
It essentially is the equivalent to God, or the creator. Now we have gods like Odin and Zeus and Thor in Marvel Comics, but this is different. It is like the god of everything. The supreme ruler of creation and compassion. It's even been represented as the writers of Marvel at one point, to give you an idea. So the one below all is the antithesis to this. The personification of destruction and hate. The one below all is trapped in the below place and manifests in realities through gamma. Basically, this means that Hulk and the other gamma mutated beings have fractions of the one below all's power. In an alternate future, it would actually take over Bruce Banner's body and use his power to devour the cosmic entity Eternity and eventually it would eradicate all life in the multiverse. Luckily, this is prevented in the Immortal Hulk storyline, but I'm telling you, go read this. At number 10, we have Sandman. This is a classic Spider-Man villain, but he gets a spot on this list because his pure strength can sometimes be overlooked. I mean, he's known to be able to lift upwards of 85 tons on top of his other powers. He's capable of transformation, his classic sand manipulation, and arguably one of his most powerful traits, his intangibility. This describes his ability to change his density to allow attacks and objects to pass through his body on command. This makes it extremely hard for Spider-Man Man to land any attacks on him, and if a counter attack comes back with one of Sandman's rock hard punches, Spidey's gonna be in real trouble. Sandman is a real threat and packs a massive punch, so on a list about power, it would have been a mistake to leave him out. At number 9, we've got Juggernaut. We all know that Juggernaut is normally an X-Men villain, but Spidey and this extremely powerful mutant do face off, most notably in The Amazing Spider-Man number 229 to 230. After Juggernaut breaks into Madame Webb's home and rips her out of her life support chair, Spider-Man needs to get serious. But as the fight rages on, it's pretty clear that even Spider-Man is going to have trouble managing the sheer might of this titanic villain. This is probably due to the fact that Juggernaut is demonically empowered by the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, and his armor is unmatched and its durability. In the 230th issue, Spider-Man even drives a huge gasoline truck right into Juggernaut's body, letting it explode into a huge fireball. But he just walks away from this. So the only way that Spidey is eventually able to take him out for good is by allowing Juggernaut to sink into a giant slab of wet cement, keeping him down, at least for now. At number eight, I'm putting Rhino. Known to be able to lift between 75 and 100 tons, this villain is one of the strongest brute force wise that Spider-Man ever faces off against. He stays back on the list simply because he still deals mainly in brute force and lacks dexterity in his approach to fighting. But a brute he is, as the Rhino is the manifestation of super durability and strength. His powers actually come about originally through gamma radiation treatments that give him several hundred pounds of added muscle tissue and bone to his body. He's known to be able to resist high caliber bullets, extreme temperatures, and fall damage even without his suit equipped. Good thing Spidey's so agile because if he lets too many of Rhino's hits land, it might be lights out for our friendly neighborhood Spider. At number seven is Mysterio. So far on the list, we've been dealing mainly with powerful villains in the traditional meaning of the word, brute strength. But Mysterio is a huge powerhouse and he should not be counted out of a list about powerful villains. His power comes from his ability to absolutely discombobulate and confuse his enemies. And in many instances, he's doing this to Spider-Man, him being a villain native to the Spider-Verse. One of the more notable face-offs between these two comes in issue 198 of The Amazing Spider-Man when Spidey faces off against 12 clones of Mysterio, or I guess 11 clones and one real Mysterio. In this encounter, Spider-Man almost drowns at the hands of the villain, but narrowly escapes his fate just in time. And this isn't even the closest call he's had with his special effects artist turned mystical supervillain. At number six is Moreland. At his base level, this vampire-like villain isn't necessarily the strongest, but his potential for extreme power comes from his ability to absorb the life force of any and all living creatures. And this ability may be a source of limitless power if used in the right way. He's also able to travel between universes, often finding himself on different versions of Earth, sapping life forces here and there. During the Great Hunt storyline, he actually kills and steals the life of Earth 311 Spider-Man, as well as a monstrous Spider-Man and yet another actual Spider-Man in another world, which is a pretty good resume already for the standards of any Spider-Man villain. However, he still isn't able to take on the Earth 616 Peter Parker, but a universe traversing vampire creature that saps power from other superpowered beings is not to be taken lightly. At number five, we have Venom. 
Spawned by the Elder God Null, Venom is a symbiote that latches onto a host and takes it over, giving them a dark and menacing appearance and extremely powerful set of abilities. I mean, seriously, if you check out Venom's power set, it's pages long. Even without a host, the symbiote can use its slimy biomass to grab onto things and attack using tentacle-like extensions of itself. But when it does latch onto a host, it's able to mix its own power with that of whoever it's taking over. So when Peter Parker is taken over, there's a different set of abilities in Venom's arsenal than when Eddie Brock is overtaken. But Brock's Venom is a pretty serious villain on his own, touting telepathy, superhuman stamina, and immunity to Spider-Man's spidey senses. This last ability is hugely significant and gives Venom a huge boost of power, specifically when facing off against Spider-Man. I mean, Spidey with no Spidey senses, he relies on it pretty heavily during battle, so that's a big one. At number four is the Red Goblin. This Green Goblin Carnage hybrid poses a serious threat to Peter Parker on numerous occasions. And honestly, I don't blame Spider-Man for allowing so many close calls. The Red Goblin is what happens when Spider-Man uses nanites to take away Norman Osborn's ability to use the Green Goblin formula. Because as he searches for his powers once again, Norman comes in contact with the Carnage symbiote and bonds with it. He then uses uses his ingenuity to remove Spider-Man's nanites and is able to use the Green Goblin formula once more. And a Green Goblin with the added powers of the Carnage symbiote is no joke. This hybrid villain is actually part of a major finale that caps off the Amazing Spider-Man comic series. So you can take a look for yourself at the sheer power of Red Goblin by reading the event Go Down Swinging, issues 797, which would be the Amazing Spider-Man issues 797 to 801. Shoot me a DM and let me know what you think. I didn't know much about Red Goblin for this list, so I'd love to hear some trivia. At number three is Fire Lord. Easing into the top three is when we start running into these cosmic bad guys that bring otherworldly levels of firepower to the table. This Herald of Galactus is no ordinary bad guy. In fact, he wields the Power Cosmic, a source of nearly limitless power, and he sure doesn't hold back when facing off against Spider-Man. Their fateful encounter takes place in the Amazing Spider-Man number 270 when Fire Lord makes his way to Earth, but is immediately intercepted by Spider-Man. Luckily, Spidey is in his symbiote suit and gives this cosmic bad guy a run for his money. It's a pretty harrowing battle though and gives us a reason to put Fire Lord right near the top of this list. At number two, we have Carnage. This very powerful and very dangerous villain originates at Rikers Island Prison, where a serial killer named Cletus Cassidy is infected by the asexually produced offspring of Venom. And it's all because Venom comes back to save Eddie Brock at the prison and leaves the Carnage symbiote behind. If only they realized that a few metal bars weren't gonna stop the symbiotes from finding their hosts, Spider-Man might never have had to deal with Carnage in the first place. Now, Cletus's Carnage is known to have a little less of a refined fighting ability than Eddie Brock and Patrick Mulligan, but he is significantly stronger. He's even known to surpass both Venom and Spider-Man's strengths combined with a lifting capacity of 80 tons. And remember, there's a crazed serial killer behind the guise of this unstable symbiote. Cletus Cassidy was already a dangerous and determined sociopathic killer far before Carnage ever came into the picture. All right, at number one, we have the one and only, you probably already guessed it, Thanos. During the Battle of Titan, Thanos is confronted by Iron Man, Doctor Strange, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and Spidey. And I think we all know what happens next. It's not the greatest outcome for the heroes, including Spider-Man, and this is pretty easily argued as being one of Spider-Man's most perilous matchups of his whole life. And sure, some of it is circumstance, and Thanos does have the Infinity Stones, but most of why this is such a game-changing battle is because of Thanos' sheer power on his own. He's by far the most powerful Eternal that comes from Titan, and is categorized as a Category 1 Life Ender by the Nova Corps. He's not just a threat to Spider-Man, but to the whole cosmos. And if not for this one fateful encounter with Spider-Man, he wouldn't have even made his way onto this list, because otherwise, Spider-Man would have no reason fighting such a powerful villain. Thanos is just out of Spider-Man's leagues in terms of power, and that's not a diss to my favorite superhero, it's just the sad truth of the matter. At number 10, we have Talon and the Court of Owls. Now, what gives Talon power isn't his might as an individual villain, but the power he has over the Court of Owls, an organization that has posed a serious threat to Batman time and time again. But that doesn't mean that Talon hasn't done damage on Batman single-handedly either. One of the Talons, William Cobb, is actually responsible for killing members of the Wayne family and also for attempting to turn Dick Grayson evil. Once again, his level of brute force is not out of Batman's range, but 
having this type of influence on Batman's life, both on the streets of Gotham and in his personal life, at least has Talon squeezing onto the end of this list among the other powerful bad guys to come. All right, at number nine, we have Mr. Freeze. Often dismissed as a campy and relatively harmless villain, Mr. Freeze brings more to the table than Arnold Schwarzenegger's goofy portrayal in Batman and Robin. Mr. Freeze's armor is actually known to be extremely durable, with its newest iteration being strong enough to deflect bullets and protect from explosions. And on top of that, of course, he's got his freeze gun. This unique weapon shoots a blast of ice cold energy that freezes everything in its path, often leaving its targets encased in a tomb of ice. He's also a scientific genius, having designed and built every piece of equipment he wears and every weapon he uses. So his capabilities for years to come may only get more and more dangerous to Batman as he innovates his armor and weaponry further. And time is on his side, considering his lifespan has increased since the day he started wearing his Sub-Zero suit. At number 8 we have Solomon Grundy. This villain may not strike you as posing a huge threat to Batman, but you might be surprised. Also known to be a villain to Superman, Solomon Grundy is actually known to have a strength level on par with the Man of Steel himself. So that alone is enough for this guy to make a list about sheer power. With many of Batman's villains being tricksters and glorified terrorists, Solomon Grundy's extreme power has him standing out from the crowd no matter which way you look at it. And this villain has literally been dead before, so it's insinuated that he's pretty much invulnerable. And if Batman ever finds a way to take him out, it most likely won't be for good. And it surely isn't ever easy to do so either. At number 7 is Deathstroke. Slade Wilson, or Deathstroke, is an extremely powerful bad guy who is basically a genetically enhanced super soldier with super durability, speed, strength, everything. Super everything. He is also a skilled tactician and martial artist, making him extremely competent in battle. In the Identity Crisis storyline, Deathstroke is hired by Dr. Light to protect him from the Justice League, who are tracking him down for a horrible crime. When Deathstroke comes after the Justice League, he shows them just how powerful and strategic he can be, and takes out all of them, including Batman, beating him up so badly that he doesn't really see another beating like this until nightfall. At number 6 is The Predator. This bad guy isn't from the Batman universe, nor is he from any comic book world originally. Predator started in the self-titled movie featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Weird how that's the second time Arnold has made an appearance on this list. Anyway, this villain is a very unique one and he faces off against Batman in Batman vs Predator, a comic book series in 1991. It's a pretty epic face off that lasts four long issues and there are some pretty epic moments. What ends up sealing the deal for Predator is when Batman equips a very powerful armor and uses all the gadgets available to him to take out the alien. But the final tool that does the trick ends up being a baseball bat. Yep, you heard right. Batman beats the hell out of Predator with a baseball bat, leaving the alien to finish himself off with his own sword. It's a pretty brutal defeat. But did we really expect Predator to win? At number 5 we have the Batman who laughs. This villain is a force that Batman only faces off against here and there, but when he does, it's never an easy fight. This is because the Batman who laughs is a disturbing combination between Batman and the Joker giving him the smarts and fighting skill of Batman and the absolute insanity of the Joker. Luckily, in the fight I'm thinking of for this entry, Batman gets the best of this crazy villain and gives him an absolutely savage beatdown. But it never seems to be enough to wipe the smile off of this villain's face. So it's not the most satisfying win for Batman in any case. The Batman Who Laughs has the power of Dr. Manhattan, as well as the power of every crisis in the history of the world. Don't ask me how this happens, but when it does, the whole of reality shakes in response. At number 4 we have the White Martians. With the same power as Martian Manhunter, these extraterrestrials are nothing to be taken lightly. Much like other classic depictions of alien creatures, these guys have a proclivity for taking over other planets planets and enslaving races at will. So when they get together and form a team called the Hyper Clan, the Justice League only finds out about their plans after it's too late. And it's chaos. Basically, the Justice League gets totally overpowered and all the team members are captured. Except for Batman. Yes, they think Batman is as good as dead so they leave him on the battlefield to die alone. But can you guess whether or not that's what happens? Right, Batman comes back with a vengeance and carries out a stealthy mission to take out the Martians one by one and freeze his team of heroes before it's too late. 
but it's a close one. At number three, we have Ares, the god of war. In Dark Knight's metal, there are a number of different incarnations of Batman, and all of them are extremely powerful in their own ways. But one that might stand out from the rest is basically Batman wearing the helmet of Ares. Ares, for those of you who don't know, is the god of war in ancient mythology. And just to show how supremely powerful Batman could be, writers decided to put him in a comic with Batman and have Batman face off against him and win. He does get help from Wonder Woman, and it's by no means an easy fight considering Ares is after all the god of frickin war. But Batman ends up taking his helmet and becoming the new god of war in the process. This sort of turns him into a tyrant, but that's besides the point. Ares is definitely one of Batman's strongest villains he's ever fought. At number two, we have evil Superman from the Dark Knight storyline. This one, we all know. The famed face-off between an evil incarnation of Superman and a well-armored Batman. This event, which eventually inspired the Zack Snyder film Batman vs Superman, chronicles the epic war between the infinitely powerful Kryptonian alien Superman and the mortal Bruce Wayne. What makes this event so impactful and popular is that on paper, there's a huge discrepancy in power between these two. Anyone betting on the outcome of the fight would probably put their money on Superman. But what ends up taking place is entirely unexpected, with Batman taking the win over Superman at the end of the day. But it's fair to say this isn't easy by any means. It's Superman. He's only at number two because number one is nearly impossible to contend with. So last but certainly not least is Darkseid at number one. During the final crisis event, Darkseid and his army invade Earth and take out a bunch of Earth's heroes. At first, this includes Batman, who's imprisoned quite easily by Darkseid and kept in his custody. And this is yet another huge mistake to leave Batman alive because when Darkseid uses his anti-life equation on all of Earth, Batman is unaffected in Darkseid's custody. And he eventually finds a way to escape and hunts down Darkseid. Batman gets Darkseid good with a special god-killing bullet seriously injuring him and nearly killing him. But Darkseid comes back at him by sending him back in time. But once again, even though it really looks like it, Batman isn't actually killed. It's pretty impressive that a mortal superhero is able to do so much damage on a literal ancient god who is otherwise used to taking everything in his way. But will someone finally learn that banishing Batman isn't gonna do the trick? Somebody's gotta take him out. Not that I want that, but it would be for their own good. This list is an example. Okay, that's the end of the list. Did you guys agree with my selections or did you disagree or somewhere in between? Leave all your thoughts in the comments below and let me know if I missed anything. Enjoy your social media with responsibility, but follow me on Instagram if you like to keep up with me. Until next time, this has been Top 10 Nerd. I've been your host, Ben Ball. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.